Lukey, I'm here. This is a big fight weekend. I had to get Dakota. He's not my little bro. I'm not his big bro. We're just bros. There's no hierarchy to bros. Dakota, you're the only person that can nerd out with me, like me on this. Let's get nerdy. Bro, I like that. There's no hierarchy to bros. That's a fucking shirt right there. Clip it. That's what I do on this show. Hellenius, uh Wilder. I was I called for this fight. I'm glad Hellenius gets this fight. That being said, very, very nervous for Hellenius just chances the closer it gets to. I don't see any famous people in his camp. I believe his camp mm -hmm. consistently or consisted exclusively of being in Finland, which I feel like is kind of a red flag, right? Because we don't know a lot of Finnish heavyweights that are doing really well. Knocked out in his fourth fight from his current fight um, by Gerald Washington. Had the renaissance against Adam Kawanaki. Four-inch reach advantage to Deontay Wilder. I guess we keep saying it. Does this fight ultimately come down to what Wilder exists now? I mean, that's definitely the main factor. You know what I'm saying? If it's 2018, 2019 Wilder, I think he's going to do what he did to everybody other than Tyson Fury. You know what I'm saying? But I do think that there's a possibility that he's not that and that even if he is, that Hellenius's speed and one-punch power, because he does have decent hand speed for a guy his size, I think stylistically, you know, he can cause some problems for Deontay because it's pressure and hand speed from a guy that's the same size as him, if not bigger. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited about this fight because it's Wilder. Wilder is one of those guys that when you put his name, that when you put it in line, people definitely are excited to see some Deontay Wilder action in the mix. That being said, not excited about this paywall. You've talked about the fact that boxing is kind of pricing you out of the sport. How do you feel about Wilder versus Hellenius? A very good matchup, a very interesting matchup, being forced behind a paywall. It's not, I, I just don't feel like it helps the sport. It doesn't help uh, give exposure. And I think most of all, it is, you know, inflating the value of what a pay-per-view is essentially where it's, if if this is a pay-per-view, well, what else is a pay-per-view? And then is that going to start costing more? And the more paywalls you put between the fans and the fights, it's just like, it becomes a more exclusive niche sport and if the goal is to expand the viewership and make it easy for the fans to get to which that's clearly not the goal but if that's the goal this is not helping and it is frustrating when it's just like you know if you're just like a normal guy it's like i don't have fucking 90 bucks every weekend to spend on a fight you know what i'm saying and i'm a fucking i'm a diehard well i think that's the issue right Boxing is getting to a place where it's like you can't casually go to the bar, eat out at restaurants, have other interests, go see movies like music. It's getting to a point where there's so many paywalls. You have to exclusively your sole interest has to be boxing or you have to pick and choose. And I think that's dangerous for the sport of boxing. Yeah, and it's 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 um, it's pay-per-view has always, I think, been an issue and i thought that the subscription model was going to mostly solve that and it feels like it's just adding another expense to what was already a pretty big pay-per-view market if anything there's more fights than ever that are being put on pay-per-view and are being put on pay-per-view on subscription services so there's two layers of payment to get through just to watch a boxing match and five out of 10 of them are on one of these fire stick roku you know streaming on your computer platforms that a lot of people don't really know how to use bro yeah um how does this fight play out I, man my gut is telling me that it's going to be uncomfortable for deontay for a couple of rounds and then he's going to catch him I think that's probably how the fight's going to look. I think for five or six rounds, Alanius is going to hold his own and probably win the majority of the rounds. And I just think at some point Deontay is going to clip him and put him out. But don't be surprised if Deontay gets buzzed or hurt in this fight because Alanius is a very dangerous puncher. And we saw it. But, you know, what people forget is that Adam Konaski has shown 
an iron chin. You know, the number of shots he took from Mariola, we've never really even seen him buzzed, and this guy stopped him twice. So I think that does speak to his, you know, his punching power. Also think he's at the height of his confidence. He's not the same guy. He he really believes in himself. Let's touch on some of the other things because I, I want to go over this. Caleb Plant, Anthony Durrell, good co-main event. Plant coming off a pay-per-view loss to Canelo. Kind of the noticeable thing I notice is Justin Gamber's out of the corner. Now it's Stephen Breadman Edwards co-training with Richie Plant. No Langer training at City Boxing. Now he's at DLX Boxing in Vegas. I guess my question more so than the fight is, there's a lot of change in Caleb Plant's life from financial change to the team around him. Does anything change inside the ring with all these changes we're seeing outside of the ring? I mean, I think he's fought in a pretty consistent manner his whole career. So I think with Caleb, as far as his boxing style, I think we know what we're going to get. Hopefully there's just, you know, some things added to it. I don't know enough about the changes that he's making to know if it's going to help him or make him better. But I think Darrell's a good opponent. You know, it's a big fight for him and kind of like a lateral move for, for Plant in the sense of, You know, he's the Canelo fight didn't put him in a position that he's out of the mix. He could fight anybody at 168 that he wants. But I think this is the kind of fight he's looking to have with a guy who's credible and is probably of everybody in the top 10, the most beatable. And I think that's the issue a lot of fight fans have is Caleb Plant could be in there with five guys right now that are really interesting, whether it's Charlo whether it's Benavidez, there's a there's a slew of names. David Morell comes to mind. Boo Boo Andrade, right? So, like, I'm literally not exaggerating when I say there's a slew of names. And Anthony Durrell, though credible, he's kind of at the end of his career, recently had a Kyron Davis draw. Stephen Edwards was the same coach that coached against him for that. You'd think that there's going to be parallels in this fight. I guess what kind of doesn't get – what impacts my overall enjoyment of this matchup – is the fact that it feels like there are more interesting fights out there for Plant. But as you said, this feels like a way to get him potentially back in the win column before getting into one of those big fights. And to be to Darrell's credit, he's a legitimate top 10 guy, I think, still. And, you know, on top of that, to be honest, with the exception of Canelo, Plant doesn't have that many wins that are better than an Anthony Darrell win. So... And I think the other thing people are sleeping on is Darrell hits really hard. So though we know hard, Caleb, man. we know Caleb Plant took a good shot from Jose Uzcategui, but Darrell's going to also answer some questions. I think about Plant, where we're going to learn one of the great elite traits of Caleb Plant: extremely good shape, crazy will, really good shape. Those are two things people sleep on with Caleb Plant: always a dog in the gym, in shape, and crazy. Darrell is going to kind of show if that stays after he made millions of dollars. Right. I'm, and I think that Anthony is going to press him. I think, I mean, Darrell's only lost to David Benavidez and Badu, right? Badu, but he probably should have lost to Cairo and shut it down, Davis. That's the the hidden thing. And he had a draw with Saki Obika. I was actually at that fight. Um but my point being that he's only really lost at the elite level. He's got some highlight real knockouts. You know, I don't think he's a, he's concerned about Caleb's power. You know, Anthony's always shown like a pretty solid chin. So I think that he is going to press the fight. I don't think it's going to be an easy fight. But in general, I feel like Plant's probably going to outbox him. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's an interesting fight. It's just a fight when it's on. I don't mind watching it, but it's not going to get me excited until they're in the ring, if that makes sense. I agree with that. I actually think, though, it's a really good co-man. Even though I'm I, I, the pay-per-view was pissing me off, if you're putting a card together in today's modern market, it feels like Plant and Darrell would almost be a pay-per-view in and of itself. So the fact that it's a co-man to this card, I think is kind of cool. Okay, there we go. Um, Really weird fight. Frank Sanchez fighting Carlos Negron. It feels like Frank Sanchez should be a level above this. But this speaks to something I wrote about in my newsletter this week. 
Frank Sanchez is in that Joe Joyce category, Martin Bacoli, where they have kind of a credible big win, but none of the big guys want to fight the contenders. They want to fight the fellow. So you have Usyk, Fury, Wilder, Joshua. They only want to fight each other. So Frank Sanchez, Joe Joyce, Philip Hergovic, and a few others are sitting there like, when do we get a shot? And the answer is probably like, well, when a sanctioning body makes one of them fight you or a belt's vacated. And this feels like Frank Sanchez is fighting on this card because he wants to stay active, but there's really nothing for him because the Wilders and the big boys of the division are not entertaining him at the moment. Well, and to be fair, I mean, I am mad at the big four fighting each other if they're fighting each other, which they are. So, you know, we want to see the best fight the best, but I think that there are, there's plenty of interesting fights for Frank to make him a standout for one of those guys, you know, a fight with Joe Joyce, a fight with Daniel Dubois, a fight with Jared Anderson. He does a lot, you know, Pergovich. There's a lot of great heavyweight contenders right now. And I think if they fight each other, you know, by the time the dust settles with this group of guys with Wilder and Fury and Usyk and Joshua, you know what I'm saying? There's going to be a guy that stands out, but they need to make themselves the one that stands out. So I think Frank Sanchez is about two, three years away from a fight. I'm not overly excited about that, but it's something to ne- be noticing. Uh, Gary Antonio Russell. Wait, will be Just real real quick. Why are you not excited about it? Because he's. I mean, he's... Frank is a guy where it's like he's very good. He's very good at what he does. He knows how to box. When you put him in with a guy that he's just better than and the guy doesn't really th- give him reason to be in danger, he typically gives you a 10-0 shutout. Maybe he'll stop the guy, but he kind of knows how to win. I also think there is, this is going to tell a little bit about Frank Sanchez because there's not a lot of motivation for Frank going into this fight. So Frank is going to have to self-motivate him because Negron has kind of been up and down. Carlos Negron should be excited for this fight and he should overachieve in this bout because this is his opportunity to get a a major win. This is going to tell us if Frank Sanchez can fend off the guys that he should beat. Well, yeah, I just, I, I got to, you know me, I got a soft spot for Cuban boxing and, and guys that can move and be smart. And I think that he's going to be like a heavyweight Lara where when somebody like Jared Anderson presses him, it's going to force him to open up and he's going to be in some exciting fights in the future. Antonio Russell, Emmanuel Rodriguez. It's a rematch of a fight I'm sure you probably forgot about already. It was 16 seconds. It ended way too quick. Um, Antonio Russell kind of the Russell brother that's under the radar. I'm not sure he will ever kind of get his just due. Gary Jr., one of the best featherweights of his era. Antoine looking like he's probably going to be a world champion soon. This is Antonio Russell, I think, is his moment to try to stand out, make a claim, because in a way it seems like he's about to be undisputed at 118 and then more than likely move up to 122. He's a big guy. This is Antonio Russell's moment to try to stand out, in my opinion. Emmanuel Rodriguez was in the Super Series, right? He lost to Inouye, and then he had that very controversial loss to Raymart Galaballo on Showtime that I personally thought he won. And then from that fight, I believe he went straight into the Gary Antonio Russell fight, which was a 16-second weird one, got a first-round knockout in Mexico, and now he's back in with Antonio Russell. How did the How did the first fight end? 16 seconds, it was like a head clash, and it gotcha. was a no contest. Gotcha. All right. I, You know, I don't think I've seen this brother, to be honest. And I think that's the issue is, like, this Russell brother is the Russell brother. People are like, oh, he exists? Yeah, he's the third one. You know, and it's I, I'm just kind of curious if he's going to do anything to put himself on the radar because I I feel like most fight fans don't even know there is a third Russell brother currently. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited to see him. Okay. So we haven't gotten any word. I'm hoping that there's a Fox prelim. There's no official word yet. Michelle Riviera has taken on Jerry Perez. I believe Jerry Perez recently fought and got stopped by Frank Martin. That's a comparable opponent. Let me I think that no disrespect to Jerry Perez, he's a very good fighter, but I think Michelle Riviera stylistically has a lot of advantages. Say Michelle Riviera wins this fight, are we looking at a potential next year matchup between 
say Michelle Riviera and Frank Martin? I mean, they're at a similar point in their careers, right? But I, that's that also is the has the potential to become like a, you know, like a Tank and Ryan where they have to argue on social media for a decade before they can sign a contract. Well, here's my issue with Michelle Riviere. A lot of insiders told me a while back, they said, I think Michelle Riviere might be the best lightweight in the world. And I always keep that in the back of my mind. And I guess what's frustrating is the guy seems like he's a workhorse in the gym, working his butt off. And it feels like he just can't get these big fighters to fight him. And the sanctioning bodies aren't really stepping up to do it. I guess I'm a little frustrated for Michelle Riviera because I want to see how far his skill set can take him. And it seems like he's kind of stuck in place, but it's not because of who he is. Well, and no, again, no disrespect to him, but I have seen performances for him that it's not that he's not an impressive boxer, but there is something flat about them. So I think there's a, on at times there's been a lack of like a wow factor, even though he is very skilled. Well, I think like what you're referring to is when John Fernandez dropped him, it was kind of like a boneheaded thing. And I think that he, if you talk to him, people have told me he thinks that that was a slip or something of that nature, but it's like, I think the big issue with Michelle Riviera is he doesn't really seemingly have a fan base. He doesn't have a place yeah. where there's a crowd that follows him. So he kind of needs a guy who has a following to be willing to fight him. And then he has to be willing to go into enemy territory. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think a fight with Frank Martin would be really interesting. I mean, I think him and the winner of Zapata and Jojo Diaz is a nice matchup for him, you know, and I think he's probably at that point. So now uh, we got Vito Milanicki taking on a guy named Ponce. That doesn't really matter. What's interesting is this same opponent had fought Joey Spencer. Vito's fighting at Joey Spencer's way to 154. Do we see the white boy matchup between Vito and Joey next year? That'll be a fun one, bro. I mean, it, it, that would that would definitely be a fun one. I think I that's a good fight. It is a good fight, and I think a lot of people, especially out here, would get pretty excited about it. I don't know that I've seen Vito since um, since he lost that fight. I can't remember the guy he lost to, but I, I think James that. Martin or something like that is a guy from Philly named James. But yeah. um, he, I thought that he didn't fight that much this year. This is his third fight, so that's not too inactive. I kind of like to see a prospect fight about four or five times when they're kind of at where he's at. But at the same time, he's fighting 10 round fights. He's fighting three times a year. He's staying active, but for some reason, he's not feeling active. I don't know what that is. Deep in the undercards, you know what I'm saying? And to be honest with you, like he's 19 bro, or whatever, like he's a teenager. So, you know, he's got he's there's no need to rush. It really feels like the Joey Spencer fight is coming soon because Joey's a very talented fighter, but it all it feels like they're occupying the same space, and it's not just because of their race. It's like they're guys who there's obviously talent there, there's obviously potential there, but it also feels like they don't really know what to do. Like they don't really know where to go because like Joey's a guy where it feels like they're not quite ready to send him to the top of the division yet but they trust having him on the prelims. He brings in a good audience. He has the good merch. He has a good team around him, and he's a true professional. He's doing what he's asked to do. That being said, I think Vito also, like if Vito was matched up with him, I think there's both two passionate fan bases that would be interested in seeing that fight. Yeah, and I think you could you like you could definitely have that as like a co-main event at the theater at the Garden. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of people would turn up for that. Kid that I'm really interested in, Trayvon Marshall. I think this might be one of the best prospects on the PBC roster. People aren't talking about him, but I really, really like Trayvon Marshall. Super high on him. I think that he's been fighting a lot of really, really good fights lately. Um, I'm not expecting you to know a ton about him, but I think that you should keep an eye on him because this is one of these guys that like he's fighting early on these cards but he could turn into something and he's, he's not that far away from being in kind of some meaningful fights because I think he's pretty close to being a fighter who's at that crossroads of prospect to contender. 
Yeah, no, I don't think that I've seen him. I was looking him up just now, um, but I'll definitely keep my eye out for him. I mean, he fought a good local fighter in my area from Sacramento, who at the time was training with Ray Woods, who's the stepfather of Chico Corrales, um, Ruben Torres. And Ruben's a very tough guy. He dropped Ruben. Ruben didn't get stopped. I want to say he stopped everyone but Ruben. But to take a fighter who's a, a tested fighter on the regional scene, that's like very impressive to take that type of fighter early on in your career because a lot of these guys don't really want to be tested. They don't want to know how good they are until a certain point. To me, it speaks to the level of fighter Trayvon Marshall is that he's willing to be in very, very competitive fights with very with guys looking to change their life on television, taking those type of opportunities. Yeah, bro. I'm excited to see him. Which card is he on? I'm not seeing him. He's on the um the Wilder card. We really? don't know if we'll get to see him. And then my favorite fight of the night, I really hope that this – shout out my guy, Ron Katz. Ron Katz, you're a great matchmaker. Shout out you. I'd beat you in golf, but I I'm, I like you as a matchmaker. Um, Michael Angeletti, 2020 Olympic trials, number one seed. Very, very good fighter. Taking on Joseph Adorno's brother, Jeremy Adorno. 6-0 and versus 7-0. and Fox. Please stream this fight. Me and Dakota want to watch two undefeated fighters. This is like a show box level fight. We got the number one guy oh. from the Olympic trials taking on a multiple time national champion, Jeremy Adorno. This is a very meaningful fight. This should be on some televised something because this is probably the best fight of the night, in my opinion. Hey, listen, and especially if Showtime is going to start putting early stuff on YouTube, it's like Fox PVC is going to be the only guys that don't have their undercards available. I mean, this fight, this fight is so friggin' good. And it, like their families that can't travel to this fight, their friends and the hardcore fanatics like you and me, we all deserve the opportunity to get to see this fight if we want to, because what it's a shame if there's a undefeated matchup that cha that matters so much in these young fighters lives, if that's not accessible in a world where everything is accessible. Yeah. All it takes is a fucking cell phone and a couple of mics. I mean, that's like Justin Cardona lost this past weekend and I had to watch it on someone's uh, IG live. I was like, he's fighting a really tough guy and I wanted to see the fight and I'm watching it from a cell phone video. And I'm just thinking like, I don't know. I'm just really hoping every promoter that has a major network learns there are people that want to watch the undercard and it actually helps grow your card and create excitement if you allow the fans to see from start to finish the product because these matchmakers are very good and put together great shows. Yeah, bro. I mean, when I put on the showtime on YouTube, um, I mean, it's not like crazy, but the lot, there was like 10,000 people watching that live. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, and showtime, take the guy's heads off the screen. We don't need to see their heads. Just give us a big boxing ring. Give us the screen, the action. We don't need screen. to see too. Full screen it, baby. Don't fuck around. Full screen it. Okay, let's go to the thing. Clarissa Shields, Savannah Marshall. This is one that people are very split on. Feel like up until last last week, I thought Savannah would win this fight. I'm pretty confident Clarissa's got her number. I think Clarissa's going to get her number. Uh, Daniel Perkins was on the show. I re-ran. Re -ran. Uh, I had a rerun episode on my podcast, Lukey Boxing Podcast, on whatever you get your thing, also available on this YouTube channel, is Danielle Perkins basically said that the main event and the co-main event are the same fight. It's power versus pedigree. Baumgartner and Marshall have the power. Michaela and Clarissa have the pedigree. What will win out? And when I thought about that deeply, it's like, well, I, I want to go with the pedigree, Marshall is a very compelling fighter. She's very like kind of a silent assassin. This is the most exciting fight to me, hands down this weekend. I don't know. I want to see the two get in the ring because I feel like there's true bad blood. This is kind of what we were, were hoping for in men's boxing. Dakota, break down this matchup for me. Well, and it's funny, right? As uh, boxing as a whole and men's boxing is like not doing so great, we're getting probably the two best women's fights maybe ever in the same year within a couple of months of each other. So that's a pretty big contradiction at the moment. You know, I'm, I'm leaning towards Savannah. I was watching some of her recently. 
and I've seen plenty of Clarissa, but this girl's power is just different, bro. Like I do feel like that's gonna come into uh, come into play at some point, and she's gonna catch her with something and and rock her. And I don't know that that will happen the other way. So I'm leaning towards Savannah. Um, I just think that she, you know, if she needs to box, she'll be able to box. If she needs, you know, she needs to sit down, let her power go, she'll be able to. I think Clarissa's going to give her a good fight, but I just think Savannah's a little more dynamic. So here's the way I look at it. It goes back to Daniel Perkins' expert analysis. Savannah will give you a round or two, so she'll give you those. But from rounds three, four, and five, she's going to go to the body, and then she's really trying to get you out of there in rounds five and six. So it's like, to me, the fight really begins in round two and three to see how Clarissa can adjust to the body attack of Savannah Marshall. Because what Savannah Marshall does better than any other, I think, women's boxer currently is she targets the body with very bad intentions. Yeah, at weird spots, too. Like, she whips, like, a long left hook to the body that just barely gets there, but she catches you on the end of it. She's kind of jumping with it. Like a towel. It's like she's whipping a towel, and it's like the very tip of the towel catches you. Yeah, she throws some weird shit, man. She really does. I just think that this is a different... And look, you know, I also don't think that this is Christina Hammer. I think she's at a different level than that. I don't think Clarissa's ever been in with somebody like this. I don't think Savannah's ever been in with somebody like Clarissa Shields either. But I think if you look at the Hannah Gabriel's fight, you can drop Clarissa, you can buzz her. And I think that this is the girl that's going to do it. I just think people are underestimating Clarissa Shields because her online personality. I, by um, the way, I think she's dope as fuck. That's that has nothing to do with it. No, no, no is, I'm not saying you, but I'm saying like I think the world at large sees Savannah Marshall, exciting knockout fighter who fe- seems like a female fury, and Clarissa is kind of a loud personality who's really trying to earn her respect and fights with a lot of people on Twitter. I think people are forgetting just how good Clarissa Shields is. Like Clarissa Shields is really freaking good. She's incredible, bro. I mean, she's one of the best fighters pound for pound in the world right now. And she's one of the best women's fighters of all time. But I think, you know, I just think styles make fights. And this is going to be this is going to be a a big test for both of them. One fight I don't see a issue with in terms of outcome. I'm pretty confident Michaela Mayer is going to beat Alicia Baumgartner. I think that people... Saw Bumgardner knock out Terry Harper, who's kind of a very vulnerable, kind of flat-footed, talented fighter, but just not very athletic. And it kind of played to all of Alicia Bumgardner's strengths, where she's very powerful, very explosive. And Terry Harper isn't really powerful and isn't explosive, so it was like she was getting caught at the end of the punches. Michaela's fought the tougher competition. Michaela's got the better pedigree. And I just feel like Michaela... When you hear her speak, she's saying all the things you want to hear a fighter say leading into a big fight. Whereas Alicia Bumgardner, I feel like she's speaking more from passion, more from I'm going to prove you wrong. And I feel like the where she's coming from, if she gets in a hard fight, there's going to be more seeds of doubt creeping into her mind. Whereas if Michaela's in a tough fight, I think she's already prepping for that and building the foundation for even if this fight's going hard, I'm going to mentally be all right in that fight. The well, I will say I I was impressed by the Terry Harper win. I think Terry Harper is a good fighter, but the thing about getting a knockout like that is you I'm not I don't get to see how you adjust, you know. So, you know, I never I haven't seen what it's like for her when she's uncomfortable and has to make an adjustment. Um, and I don't think Michaela is the one to have to figure that out with, and she's already shown that she can make the adjustment. You know, if she if she has to be on her toes the whole fight, she can. She's got to do the like the fight with Hamadouche and get right in the in the in the trenches and bang it out. She can do that too. So I think I definitely think Michaela's the favorite. I think the other issue is Michaela's one of those body types where you're not gonna find someone that's Michaela until fight night. And it's like that's always a tough one because basically Alicia is gonna find out on fight night if every she thinks she worked on in camp works or not within the first couple of rounds. Because there's not another Michaela Mayer just out in the world ready to spar. Her. Yeah. Like a 5'11 female featherweight. Who's comfortable fighting on the inside. 
who's physically yeah. strong, who can box, who can bang, who has the respect of men and women in the long, gym. I mean, long jab, long jab. But then, like, the other thing about, like, I think the other issue, right, is Alicia has to fight this fight where she can't be at range and she can't be in close because Michaela's going to be comfortable in close and she's going to be comfortable when Alicia is all the way out. So she has to figure out a way to get to the mid range and get out of the mid range. And that's always a tough equation because that's going to mean that she has to be very explosive, which means she could tire out quicker. So she's going to have to land something big to alter Michaela's ability to fight. I just trust Michaela's ability to weather that she has more. Basically Michaela has more room for error to win this fight. I do think Alicia is uh, stronger than Kamadouche was. So I think if, she wanted to press the fight and try to make it more physical that actually might favor her more than giving Michaela any kind of room to create angles, you know what I'm saying, and get her shots off. It might be better for her to kind of try to muscle her around and make her feel. Um, My only counter is Alicia at times when she gets there, she just likes to rest. She'll throw and rest. Michaela's active in there. So if Alicia goes there, she has to work. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Final. Michaela final two things lauren price be sure to watch her she's a stud she won a gold medal i i'm telling you she's gonna be the next women's boxing star just watch for her she's like a boxing kangaroo and i mean that respectfully but she just reminds me of like um what was that kangaroo jack or something didn't he have boxing gloves jack, bro shout yeah. out kangaroo jack yeah but um Devin Haney Cambosis, has there ever been an example of someone having a dominant performance and getting less credit for the rematch? This is basically just a business deal. Devin has to go there because Cambosis got a rematch clause. Cambosis is going to get paid well, but there's basically no excitement because what Haney does really well is what Cambosis has shown us he struggles with as a pro against Lee Selby, against Mickey Bay. He hasn't fared very well. He's won those fights, but he didn't look great. When guys keep a jab on him and don't come to him in his best performance of his career against Teofimo Lopez, Teofimo actually came towards him, which brought in George Cambosis elite trait of speed and counter punching where he was able to show that I don't see Devin Haney coming forward in this fight. So George Cambosis has to show us new elements of his game to make this anywhere competitive. I said a lot, Dakota, do you see anything changing in this fight? Not really. I mean, in order for people to get excited about rematches, the first fight has to have been competitive or close, right? Like, that's the whole reason to have a rematch. You know what I'm saying? Because the outcome of the first fight is not either completely settled or it was competitive enough that it's worth seeing again. You know, I remember scoring this fight, I think, nine to three. It just wasn't a very competitive fight. Devin made it pretty easy. And it didn't seem like George had the temperament or the tools to get past Devin's jab and, and his foot movement. So I, I think it is essentially going to be the same fight again. You know, maybe Cambosis can get a little something going, but I don't know, man. It's uh, I get why they're doing it. I don't even really like have a problem with it, but I'm not excited for it. I think the issue is it kind of robs Devin of a chance of being fighter of the year. Because he really had that great performance, but then having these two fights, it's like we got Bivol, we got Bam Rodriguez, we got even a Katie Taylor. They're all probably going to get more consideration than Devin because even though he had a fantastic performance, if he does the same performance again, they're going to go, well, his second fight, it was a business agreement. He had to knock it out. We really want to see him in with Loma or Shakur. And I think that's going to hurt him towards kind of a legacy standpoint for this year. I don't think he needs to sweat that, though, because he's the only guy at that weight neighborhood that's fighting his contemporaries. You know, he's he's the one making the most compelling matchups. That is true. And I think that Devin is not getting enough credit for the fact that he agreed to a rematch clause where he'd fly back to Australia and went to Australia. Nobody seems to really give this young man as much credit Bro, as he deserves. Which one, they, which one of these young lightweights is fighting their contemporaries. I not, mean, Teofimo not, Lopez did it with Loma and... He's not uh, a lightweight anymore, though. He's not a lightweight Yeah, anymore. he's not a light. But I'm saying, like, we've seen Teofimo do it. We've seen Shakur do it, essentially, with Valdez. That's a contemporary. We've seen Haney do it. 
but there's a slew of guys where it's just sit and wait. Yeah, I was thinking of guys that are actively at lightweight right now. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Obviously, Tiafimo and Lomachenko have both done that. Shakur hasn't fought an elite lightweight yet. I think we're all looking forward to seeing. But how we he... know it's coming. We know Shakur is going for that. We know Shakur is not going to be with the funny business. No, absolutely. Absolutely. But I th- and I think especially this year, since Loma and Tio was so long ago, I mean, this year, Devin's the only lightweight really making elite level matchups. Yeah. And it's, it's a shame, right? Because it's like people aren't really giving Devin the credit because I think that he's probably the most unpopular of the lightweights. He's He's still very popular, but he's getting that Cuban boxing treatment a little bit. Expand on that. So a lot of times with the Cuban guys, right, they're just really good technical fighters that win rounds and punch hard enough so that guys don't try to jump them. And it's not always the most exciting brand of boxing for people that don't know what they're watching. And I think that Devin is getting some of that treatment. He's getting the Lara Rigondeo treatment where it's just like what you're doing is exceptional, but it's not going to get the same kind of coverage as somebody who gets first round knockouts or somebody who has, you know, purple hair or at twi- plays video games on Twitch. I think that the other issue is it's kind of the Andre Ward issue. Devin Haney's style doesn't fit in a 30 second video. You nah. know what I mean? And it's like, if you don't fit in a 30 second video in this era, people don't have time for you. And there's a lot uh, of substance to what Devin's doing. He's not a highlight tape fighter unless you like want to you know, watch a half hour of like the, you know, the perfect jab. Like that's not the kind of He's a highlight reel. Like Bernard Hopkins is a highlight reel. And it's like, there's a lot of sweet stuff he does, but the layman fan is going to go, Oh man, he's just punching him. That looks so easy. That's why I'm saying he's getting that Cuban boxing treatment because he doesn't, he doesn't go out of his way to exchange on the inside. And he does a great job of de-impacting the fight. Is there a way Devin can beat Cambosis that gets him in conversation of fighter of the year? If he knocks him out in the first couple of rounds, you know, if he gives him that Gotti Gotti Mayweather treatment. You think so? Because the, I mean, it's not out of the running. The the thing is though, bro, if Bivol beats Ramirez, there's no, not even a conversation anymore. It all, or the whole, the conversation then is about who comes in second. Because of well, then it's be- Bam and Devin and it's Katie Taylor. I mean, those are basically the only people you can nominate this year. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's the the Bebo Ramirez fight is really what's going to determine fighter of the year in a lot of ways. Well, I mean, I think that if Ramirez wins it, would you give it to Ramirez? I think he'd be in the conversation, right? But then you'd have to start going through the you know the the fighters that you listed. I think. If Bivol wins, it's just there's not that. How could I not have him with wins over Canelo Alvarez and Zordo Ramirez in the same year? I mean, nobody's. I think that. Ramirez has a really good chance in that fight. We'll get to that when it's closer, but I think that's like people are acting like that's a shoe in for Bivol. Bivol's good, but Zordo is a lot physically bigger than Bivol. I think he is. I just think that, uh, that overall, you know, Bivol's experience at an elite level is is his edge in this fight. He's just, I think he's got a lot more experience. Dakota, where can people support you um, with all your boxing stuff? Well, they can see me on ITR Boxing pretty often. They can follow me at the Slip and Weight Podcast or at Dakota McCormick 93 on Instagram. And uh, yeah, bro. Okay, well, it was great seeing you. And um, I'll catch up with you soon.